Hello and good morning everybody um, in the room and online as well. I'm going to assume it's working because I can hear a faint echo. Great. My name is Martin Wolf and I'm chairing today's um, session and I am the branch head for Positioning Australia here at Geoscience Australia and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that this meeting is held on Ngunnawal country and I would like to acknowledge that the Ngunnawal people are the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, we work, we live and we navigate. And I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal people present today, here or online. Now today's seminar is a very exciting one for us. Uh, Geoscience Australia has recently passed a major milestone in um, the South Bend project that will provide world-class navigation capability to Australians. South Bend Early Open Services commenced in September 2022 with some major announcements that were went through uh, our minister and also the minister in New Zealand. And the seminar today will really unpack what these announcements meant, what South Bend is, what it does, what it means for Australia and why it's such a game changer. And I'll tell you a little bit about our speaker today, Simon Reynolds. Simon is the engineering manager in the South Bend project and he joined Geoscience Australia to help us out on this project in 2019. Uh, Simon has worked as an engineer on uh, aviation communications for many years since 2011 and he's worked on a generational transition from terrestrial radio systems to satellite enabled communications. Uh, Simon has been part of the South Bend journey, as I said, since 2019, and he also represents Australia at the UN International Civil Aviation Organization. So he has is very um, much part of the way that Australia engages with this capability on a worldwide stage. Now, to give him release from his work on this high adrenaline project, um, Simon in his spare time rides apparently an adventure motorbike, so it's clear that Simon likes his thrills and excitement, and therefore I really hope that you will join me in looking forward to an exciting talk on South Bend, and will be opportunity for questions after the talk. Thank you. Over to you, Simon. Okay, thank you, Martine, um, and uh, welcome to everyone in the room and online. Uh, it's great to have the opportunity to talk about um, satellite navigation, how it's used in Australia, and um, the sovereign satellite navigation capability that Geoscience has recently delivered and will continue to improve in the coming years. Um, this capability is called the Southern Positioning Navigate, uh, Augmentation Network, or SouthPan, um, and I'll talk a little bit about satellite navigation and then, and then move on to the program itself. Um, first of all, I thought it would be worth touching on where this fits into Geoscience Australia's work generally. Um, so GA is the nation's trusted source of, of Australia's Earth Sciences. Um, we have a number of strategic objectives that are laid out in our strategy 2028, uh, which are on the screen there. Uh, we contribute to building Australia's resource wealth, uh, which maximises benefits from our mineral and energy resource sectors. Uh, we support um, Australia's community safety, um, by strengthening our resilience to natural hazards, uh, particularly as, as they relate to uh, earthquakes and tsunami warnings and, and, and uh, warnings like that. Um, we uh, contribute to securing Australia's water resources, um, so we support the sustainable um, use and, and optimization of our water resources. Uh, we, we manage, or we can help to manage uh, Australia's marine jurisdictions um, to, support, to start, support the sustainable use of, of that environment. Uh, we enable an informed Australia, uh, so we equip government, communities and industry with geoscience data and information to make decisions for our nation. Um, and we also do this in a high performance environment, so um, supporting sustainability, innovation and diversity for the successful delivery of those uh, strategic objectives. Uh, however, South Penn fits into that last one, the, the purple one on the right hand side there, creating a location enabled Australia. Um, and this helps to increase economic, environmental and social prosperity of Australia through the provision of location information, which includes positioning information. Um, and, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, what is positioning? What is positioning information? Um, 
uh, position information is generally grouped in with navigation and timing, and it helps us determine where, where am I um, and perhaps when am I, so location in position and time. Um, most of us will be familiar with the, the blue dot in our favourite mapping application, Google Maps, Apple Maps, something like that. Um, and uh, while it seems like a simple representation to most of us, there's actually quite a lot of work that goes into determining where that dot appears. Um, there are various sources of, of position navigation timing, including on mobile devices. Um, you can, it, the, your device might use the cell phone network, so it can do time difference of arrival um, using the, the cell network towers that are around you. Um, that allow us to make phone calls and send messages. Um, increasingly, inertial systems are used. So um, historically, this has been made up of gyroscopes, which can be quite large. Uh, but these days, there are solid state devices, uh, accelerometers. Um, your phone will have one that helps it orient itself. Um, specific industries use terrestrial navigation aids. So marine, uh, maritime and ships use it around the coast. Uh, and aviation is a big user um, of terrestrial nav aids at, at airports and you'll see them when you're landing uh, in the aircraft. Uh, however, we've been navigating for thousands of years. So, uh, you know, sailors in, in the Roman Greek and even in Egyptian times used the stars to navigate um, their way around. Uh, even as recently as, um, uh, well, the, one of the uh, modern platforms, the Blackbird, the SR-71 Blackbird, which is a spy plane used during the Cold War, uh, had a small window in the top of the airframe and it had a camera that uh, provided a navigation input and allowed them to navigate wherever in the world they were. Uh, however, by far and away, the, the greatest source of navigation today is global navigation satellite systems. Um, they're generally quite cheap to use. Uh, they're freely available. They're very accessible. Um, and uh, each of these navigation methods um, comes with pros and cons. So on the right-hand side of the screen there, you'll see uh, this is our position in, in Geoscience Australia building today. Uh, when you're zoomed out, um, you can see there's you know a nice blue dot. But when you zoom in, you can see that the actual area that the um, the phone is displaying uh, our position is 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 quite large. There's you know tens of meters of error on that position, and each of those sources of P and T um, provide different levels of accuracy. And and GNSS provides a very very good level relatively. Um, but what was the genesis of GNSS? Why did where did it come from? Why are we using it today? Well. Um, the, the first system was the uh, United States Global Positioning System. It was originally developed for military use. However, uh, in September 1983, um, Korean Airlines Flight 7 left from Anchorage in uh, the United States there, and its intended, pass, uh, its intended path passed south of the, the Soviet Union territory, uh, over the top of Japan, and then into Seoul. However, they had a navigation error, and they were off course by uh, several hundred kilometres. Um, they were using very rudimentary inertial systems at the time and, and um, dead reckoning, which is you just follow a compass heading and, and there was an error. Um, uh, this was at the height of the, height, height of the Cold War. Um, tensions hadn't been this high since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 69. And um, the Soviets deployed interceptors. They thought this was a spy plane or a bomber uh, and they tragically shot it down with the loss of 269 people. Um, within two weeks, the, this navigation error um, was recognised and uh, Ronald Reagan declared that uh, GPS would be made um, free and open for civil use and, and, and brought forward, accelerated. Uh, so in 95, uh, GPS was declared fully operational. There were 24 satellites, which is what was required to provide global coverage. Um, and then again in, in, in 2000, uh, Bill Clinton issued a presidential order uh, that said this intentional degradation of GPS accuracy uh, would cease because um, there was a recognition that the satellite based PNT was critical to both the US and the world economy. Uh, so what's what's the value of GNSS society? It's only grown since um, its introduction in the 90s. Um, well, there's about six, six and a half billion GNSS devices worldwide today. Uh, that number is probably a bit old, so we're very quickly getting towards um, one device per person on the planet. Uh, most of these are in mass market consumer devices, so phones, tablets, laptops, um, things like that, but it's also appearing more and more in cars. Um, in, maybe one use might be to, to display a map to you when you're trying to navigate to a location you want to go to, um, but it will be increasingly used in automated cars. Um, 
and, and other safety critical solutions. So I mentioned aviation um, and uh, road, rail, maritime, they're all increasing their use of, of, of GNSS. Uh, the US had determined that uh, generates roughly $1.4 trillion in economic benefits uh, to just the US. That's probably an underestimate of what the true value is. Um, and the UK did a similar study, uh, about 11.3% of their GDP is supported directly by GNSS. So if, if GNSS wasn't available, you'd lose 10% off the UK economy. Um, because of that reliance, uh, those same countries um, have done studies into what would happen uh, if GNSS was taken out. And it would be a billion dollars a day in the US, in US dollars. Uh, and in the UK, they estimate $6.7 billion every five days. So these large numbers, this it highlights the criticality of GNSS and also its widespread use. Um, other developed, both developed and developing economies have a strong reliance on, on GNSS and it's getting stronger. It's not getting, it's not fading, it's getting stronger. The Europeans uh, probably have the most extensive program into the use of GNSS in society and they publish these very detailed reports every two years on, on um, how GPS is used and GNSS is used. Uh, and I think there's a lot of information on this slide, particularly in the top left diagram, but the, the point to take away is that um, the Asia Pacific uh, currently accounts for more than half of uh, the installed base of GNSS devices, and it's also the fastest growing. Uh, other regions like Africa, um, where there's heavy use of satellite based technology um, uh, because you don't require uh, much ground infrastructure to, to use those capabilities, uh, it's increasing very quickly as well. Uh, Africa has the, the fastest growing population um, out of any region in the world, so um, we can only expect those numbers to increase. On the bottom left, you can see the breakdown of, of which industries are the heaviest users of, of GNSS. So, uh, consumer solutions, um, you know, handheld devices, things like that, uh, make up a large part. Road makes up a large part. Um, and you know, think of when you order Uber Eats or or from other applications, menu log, things like that. Uh, and you can see the driver coming towards you. That's enabled by GNSS. If there wasn't GNSS, that wouldn't that function wouldn't be available. Uh, and then there's these other sectors, um, transport like manned aviation, uh, railroad. Um, Geomatics, so surveying, uh, are very heavy users of GNSS. Uh, in Australia, agriculture is a big sector and growing. Uh, resources is a big sector and growing. Uh, emergency response, um, so it, it's endemic through our society. Um, on the right-hand side there, you can see that the number of devices is, is only increasing and projected to increase, mostly in the consumer segment, and um, which have relatively low cost devices, 150 euros, uh, which is quite cheap given the performance you get. Uh, and in augmentation services, so the orange part of the bar there is, is increasing. These are value-added services where basic GNSS signals are augmented in, in some manner to uh, improve performance. And, and there's a choice of navigation satellite systems. So I mentioned GPS, but there are others, and uh, they can generally be um, uh, categorised into three categories. So the first is what we might call core constellations. These are the big, truly global navigation satellite systems, uh, global positioning system from the US. Uh, GLONASS was um, provided by Russia starting in the around the same time as GPS, maybe the, the late 90s. Um, the European Galileo system um, has been in development and for about 20 years, there's 24 satellites I think there now, and they're about to reach their, their full service performance. Um, and the Chinese have a system called Beidou. Um, so they're the, they're the truly global systems. However, there are additional so-called regional navigation satellite systems where um, a particular country wants to uh, have their own sovereign capability um, and be able to position off just their own system. Um, and these, these constellations tend to be more modest. They're between five and seven satellites. Uh, there's the NAVIC system in India, uh, the QZSS quasi-Zenith satellite system in Japan. Uh, there's one under development in Korea. Um, so, so they're, they're countries that, that wanted that sovereign capability. Um, and then the satellite based augmentation system. So uh, that's what Southbound is. It's a, it, it uses uh, two or three satellites um, to provide corrections to uh, these basic GNSS signals. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about how that works. But when you add up all these, these satellites and these signals, um, you, you get kind of a, uh, a, 
a plot or a schematic that looks like this, where the global uh, navigation satellite systems, the global ones are in this inner ring here. There's, they're in something called a medium Earth orbit. They're about 23,000 kilometres above the Earth's surface and they orbit twice a day. Um, the regional navigation satellite systems tend to be a combination of satellites in geostationary Earth orbit. So they, these are ones that orbit around the equator at the same rate as the Earth turns. So as far as the user's concerned, the satellite doesn't move and this has several advantages. Um, uh, in other applications like digital TV, you can put a TV dish on top of your, uh, on, on top of your house and point it at the satellite and you don't have to move it. The satellite doesn't move, you don't have to move the dish. Um, other types of satellites include these, these uh, they, they have this kind of figure eight orbit um, and the speed of the satellite changes depending on where it is in the orbit. So when it's in the, the big part of the figure eight, it's moving quite quickly and, it, and it's close, it's, it's closer to the Earth. And then as it rises um, up over Japan, um, the, the satellite slows down and spends a lot of its time in, in this part of the orbit. Um, for Japan, that means, um, uh, well, Japan has this urban canyoning issue. They have lots of tall buildings um, and the buildings block out other GNSS satellites. Uh, so in order to solve that specific problem, they have the, they structure the constellation. So the Japanese satellites spend a lot of their time um, right above the urban canyon and uh, people at street level can, can receive those GNSS signals uh, unobstructed. Uh, and, and that's what these, these outer orbits are that are inclined to the equator. Now, what that means for the Asia Pacific region and Australia is we've actually got a lot of satellites that are visible um, between the Korean, Indian, Japanese systems, uh, the, the way that the Chinese structure their constellation, some of their satellites spend a lot of time over Asia Pacific. Uh, so this map on the bottom right um, is a heat map and, and red, you can see more satellites, uh, blue, you can see relatively less. Um, so there, there are a lot of satellites here. Uh, so if there's so many satellites in our region, why, why do we need an SPAS capability? Why do we need South Pan? Uh, well, to understand that, um, we probably need to talk about the technology and, and some of its limitations. So the way GPS and other GNSS work is the satellite provides a, a ranging signal um, and, some, and it encodes some data on that signal. So it, it tells you where the satellite is, um, uh, some corrections about the, the time, uh, its status, so it's got health status. Uh, is, is the satellite healthy? Is it transmitting? Is it not? Um, and a user receiver can receive this one-way communication, this one-way signal. Uh, it doesn't have to transmit anything back to the, the, these constellations and it can use that information from multiple satellites to do time difference of arrival and determine where on the Earth's surface it is. Um, this is very scalable, so because it's a one-way broadcast, you don't have to um, add more infrastructure as the number of users increase. Um, and uh, most of these are provided free to the international community. Um, there's no there's no charge associated with these systems. Uh, however, there are limitations. There, there are errors pre present on these signals. Um, there are uncertainties in the orbit, so the, the satellites will transmit uh, where they are, but they don't know exactly where they are. Orbits degrade. The, the shape of the Earth isn't perfectly spherical. It's this oblate spheroid. It's a, like a squashed sphere. Uh, and this causes um, the orbits of these satellites to change over time. Um, the timing is very important. Um, each, each GNSS satellite has uh, very accurate atomic clocks, but these clocks drift over time and they, they sometimes have clock jumps um, and, and these introduce errors on the ranging signals. Uh, there are other more obscure um, uh, errors that can, can can be introduced. There's something called signal deformation or the so-called evil waveform uh, where it, uh, the, the receiver can't get an accurate range to the satellite. Um, there's also errors introduced as the signals pass through the, the, the atmosphere. So the ionosphere is the upper layer of, of Earth, um, of the Earth's atmosphere. It's electrically charged and it uh, the height of the ionosphere and therefore the delay introduced by the ionosphere changes as the Earth rotates. So there's an interaction between the, the solar wind coming from the sun and the Earth's magnetosphere. Um, so as uh, during the day the ionosphere is compressed 
uh, at night because that you don't have the solar radiation pressure, it, it kind of rebounds and um, there are instabilities introduced as, as you go from day to night. There's um, a lot of fluctuations um, are introduced. Uh, there's also tropospheric delay. So water vapour um, can introduce a, a small amount of delay uh, to, or, or error um, to those signals. Uh, and that's a, that's an error that can be cancelled out. So the solution to this is to augment basic GNSS. Um, on the bottom right there, uh, this is what you'll get from a basic GNSS signal. It's, it's what you might get from your phone today. Um, every second or every five seconds, uh, your GNSS receiver will provide a position output. Uh, and if you plot all those, you can see um, over time, you get this kind of error uh, in, 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 in the position solution. Um, this is up to, I think this is five metres, up to 10 metres. So most of the position is contained within a five metre bound. But because these errors can change um, over time, uh, that, that level, uh, it, it could be, you could have more position error than what's displayed on this, um, this chart here. So what is a satellite based augmentation system? Um, in order to correct those errors, uh, most augmentation systems use a network of reference stations. So the reference stations are surveyed very accurately. They know exactly where they are um, and they can determine what the range between the satellite and the, and the reference station should be. And then it can compare that to what it actually measures, what it observes from each GNSS satellite. Um, the, uh, those reference stations send their um, observations back to a central processing facility that uses the data from all those reference stations. Uh, it, it calculates the orbital errors, the clock errors, the atmospheric errors, and it packages that into a standardized format that can be used by GNSS receivers or SBAS enabled GNSS receivers. Um, they, those corrections are then uh, supplied to a satellite uh, via an uplink facility and are rebroadcast to the user. So the user takes their own observations of the GNSS satellites and combines it with the correction data that it gets from SBAS and this achieves a, a more accurate position than, than you can with basic GNSS signals. Um, it, this is a very uh, widespread um, technique and, and system. Uh, and you can see in the top right there, uh, there have been SBAS systems in um, the US and Europe for going on 20 years now. There's one in Russia, there's one in China, there's one in India. Uh, the African, there's an African program that's in under development at the moment. Um, there's also a Japanese one uh, and a Korean one that's in development. And But you can see there's a couple of areas of the earth that aren't covered. Uh, South America is an obvious um, uh, missing piece there. Uh, they've got certain issues around that. They've, they've got the, the South Atlantic anomaly is, is an anomaly in the Earth's magnetosphere that has causes particular issues with GNSS in that region. Um, but the other gap is, is uh, you know, the, the Southern Asian Pacific region, uh, including Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to touch on was the variety of SBAS services. So um, there's, there's kind of a current generation service, which is called L1 SBAS. L1 is just the signal it's delivered on. Um, at, and the, the frequency of the signal is about one and a half gigahertz. Uh, and it augments a single signal from a single navigation satellite. Uh, almost all services, L1 SBAS services provided today, augment the L1 GPS service. Uh, the kind of next generation that's just starting to be implemented now is dual frequency multi-constellation SBAS. Uh, this, this augments two frequencies, so by having two frequencies you can cancel out a lot of the atmospheric errors. Um, and by using more than one satellite constellation, you've got more satellites, you can get a better position. Uh, so that's the multi-constellation aspect. Uh, there's also this technique called precise point positioning where um, you use a, a certain technique using a little bit of a, additional correction data. Um, and that can be delivered by SBAS, it can be delivered by other means as well, but in our case, we're going to be delivering it by SBAS. Um, and over time, you can get the accuracies down to the, the tens or, or even below 10 centimetres. Uh, and that's becoming quite a popular technique today. Okay, so the rest of the world uh, believes in SBAS, um, but how do we know it's right for Australia? So uh, this is the question we asked a, a couple of years ago. So Geoscience Australia, um, arranged to have a test signal, a, a, a live test signal 
um, between 2017 and 2020. And we went to industry, we went to users, uh, as many as we could and uh, engaged them and said, if there was an SBUS, what would that mean for your life, for your business operations? Um, how would you use it and, and what value would that be? Um, so there was a, a technical evaluation done. Uh, is this going to fit in with the existing um, infrastructure and other services that are out there? Uh, but there was also an economic benefits analysis. So how much is this worth to you? Um, and the counterfactual was examined as well. So given that SBAS is available in other parts of the world, what if it isn't available in Australia? And uh, given that a lot of technology comes from overseas um, and that the two largest markets are, you know, in um, Europe and the US and, and, and China, which have SBAS, uh, if, if I was designing a product for those markets, I would design it with SBAS in mind. Um, whereas if, if those products are then sold into Australia, and we don't have it, what does that mean for, for the Australian economy and society? Um, and we came up with some, some relatively large numbers. So over a 30 year period, uh, our uh, estimate of the, the economic benefit is $6.2 billion. Um, this is probably a very conservative estimate. So we only looked at existing uses of, of SBAS, um, existing receivers, uh, and we made some very conservative assumptions about the uptake of, of new receivers and, and how SBAS might be used. Um, new Zealand, the New Zealand government and the industry uh, also recognised the value of this technology uh, and they participated in the test bed project um, and uh, came up with a figure of 1.4 billion and we're now in a partnership with them to deliver SBAS capability for both countries. Um, in Australia, the, the two largest sectors were resources and agriculture, uh, and in New Zealand it, it was agriculture, but you can see on the chart there there's you know, significant benefits to other sectors, um, including maritime, um, road rail, water utilities, uh, things like that. And we anticipate we'll deliver these benefits in, in the coming years. So a little bit more detail on the benefits. Um, uh, this is just touching on some. I, I, I was very surprised at the number of, um, of new uses and, and, and ways that GNSS is used, and we can't cover them all today. Um, but it, it, it goes from simple things like doing cadastral surveys in rural areas. At the moment, it, it takes quite a lot of time to do those, um, waiting for the, the precision to come into the, um, the survey that you're doing. And with SBAS, the amount of time that you spend doing that uh, is reduced. Um, it aids with accurate data collection in, in remote regions, uh, particularly outside the, the cell network coverage. Um, road applications, automated driving is a big one, um, along with cooperative intelligent transport systems, which is a, um, a way that uh, vehicles can, can talk to each other and do traffic management and, and, and things like that. Um, digital mapping, um, regulating the speed of vehicles, so uh, maybe like trucking fleets where you, you want to um, have a certain safety target and maintain that target uh, and be able to understand what your drivers are doing, um, that would help. Um, and a uh, never never a very popular one um, and, and certainly not one that is implemented in Australia at the moment, but a lot of countries are looking at this is real-time road pricing. So that might be to address congestion issues. Um, for example, in London, that's one of the ways they, they address traffic congestion is um, they have a price and you need to know where the car is to do that. Um, but also as we transition from um, uh, petrochemical based uh, engines to uh, electric cars, uh, a lot of the, the road funding is, is um, provided by a fuel levy and cars are getting more efficient and cars don't use fuel. So the, the amount of revenue generated by that uh, policy is, is kind of reducing over time. Um, so that, that's another way that you might um, solve that problem. Uh, Train systems, um, navigation, uh, you can um, increase the efficiency of a particular rail line if you have a more accurate position and a trusted position of where the train is. Uh, so you need to maintain safety, make sure um, trains don't get too close, um, but you can make better use of the, the, the track that you've got. Uh, it also helps with asset management, um, worker and track vehicle safety, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, livestock applications, this is one of the, the, the more interesting ones to me, I guess. Um, with very accurate uh, positioning of, of, a, of an animal, of livestock, um, you can uh, have virtual fencing. So particularly with cows, when they're young, 
uh, you, you, you put a SBAS enabled ear tag on them. And when they go to a location that you don't want them to go, it plays a tone. And so when they're young, you, you train them with shock collars. Um, and, and after the, you know, they, the, the ear tag plays a tone. And then if they keep going, they get a little shock. Um, that trains them to respond to the tone. And then you take the, the collars off and you can teach them not to go outside a particular area or a field, which you don't need a fence for now. Uh, you can also encourage them to use all of the pasture in the field. Um, uh, you know, you can set them up in a line and, and, and teach them to, to consume the pasture in a line, uh, which is a little creepy, but um, <laughs> uh, very efficient. Um, there's also behavioural modelling uh, to enable disease detection. So uh, some livestock, um, when they're diseased, the rest of the herd will stay away from them. Uh, so you can develop uh, software that picks up those kinds of patterns. Uh, and alerts the farmer that a particular um, life uh, animal might be diseased, and they can, um, you know, address the medical problem before it it, um, it, it passes away. Uh, sheep. So when when there's predators around, a sheep herd will run around in a circle, and um, this uh, prevents the predator from getting into the herd, and it also throws the weak animals out to the outside. So that's why they do it. But with this accurate position. Uh, again, you can pick up that pattern and it can notify the farmer and that there might be a predator around and, and they can go out and respond uh, to the threat. Uh, maritime applications, um, obviously safer navigation when you have more accurate positioning and uh, the recent um, uh, ish, uh, incident in the Suez Canal is, is perhaps a good example of where you might want um, automated and accurate positioning on, on a ship. Uh, however, there are other, other applications like uh, when you load a container ship, um, you need to maintain a clearance below the bottom of the hull and the shallowest part of the, the, the route that the ship is going to take. Uh, so particularly when ships leave Australia and, and travel up towards Asia, um, they pass through a, a particular area and, it, and it's shallow. Um, if you've got more accurate um, knowledge of where the bottom of the hull is, you can put more cargo on the ship without compromising safety, and that has economic benefits to, to the shipping industry. And then, of course, there's aviation. So um, SBAS provides, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, SBAS provides better performance and you can do more um, with GPS on, on the aircraft when you've got SBAS. Uh, a couple of examples. Um, uh, mining sites are becoming uh, more automated. The mining trucks are, are increasingly self-driven um, in a very controlled environment. And you can see in this slide here, uh, you know, if there's um, a, a drop away of the land on one side, uh, an exclusion zone over here, maybe where you're doing um, detonations of explosives as part of the mining operation, you want to pass other self-driving uh, trucks um, or even, you know, small utility vehicles. You want to be very sure of where the, where the truck is so that you're not going to deviate from the intended path. Um, and it, it needs to be very accurate because you're driving on a road that's only so wide. Uh, agriculture, uh, farmers are able to use, uh, make better use of the land if they have better position of where the tractors are. Uh, so you might want to keep a minimum distance between tractors while they're um, sowing the seeds, uh, but also you can apply water more accurately to where the plants are. You can use less seeds to get the same um, return on your crops the same yield um, and generally use less resources to get the same amount of, um, of, of yield. However, aviation is, is, is a key user of SBAS. That, that's really why SBAS have been developed in other countries, um, was for use by aviation. Um, so on, on the right hand side here is a approach chart that a pilot would use to uh, approach the Adelaide airport. Uh, so this is a top down view. Um, the pilot would join the approach at one of these points out here. They would become runway aligned. Um, and this, this navigation function you can do with just GPS. You don't need SBAS to do it. Uh, however, currently the vertical path either requires a terrestrial nav aid to, to aid the, the descent, um, or it requires the pilot to um, use relatively large uh, buffers and use barometric um, altimetry to uh, ensure that they don't come down too soon, uh, that they, came, they come down at the right rate, 
uh, and, and are able to land safely at the airport, even when there's cloud or fog or, or whatever else is uh, present at the airport. Um, having an SBAS input into the aircraft uh, allows this, this approach to be conducted um, uh, to lower altitudes than might currently be available, uh, particularly at regional and rural um, aerodromes. Um, and, and increases the chance that the aircraft will be able to land at that airport without needing to use fuel to, to, do, to try another approach if they can't get in the first time, or even to divert to another airport if the weather is just um, not working for them. And you really want to trust the, the, your position in this case. So the bottom right there, it's an A350, Airbus A350. Uh, they tend to have about 400 people on board. The landing speed's about 350 kilometres an hour. And when you're landing in conditions like this, you want to be sure that the position the plane thinks it's in is the actual position. You don't want to come down too soon. And um, the vertical path is, is a very important part of the operation. Uh, there was a, a recent incident where a, a large aircraft came uh, very close to, to not landing at the runway. Um, so, you know, I think in general, um, and particularly in Australia and New Zealand, we have a very good safety record, um, but these kind of um, errors do occur and SBAS can, can help prevent that. Um, so that leaves us with the SouthPan program. Uh, SouthPan is the implementation of SBAS in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, it's a joint effort, like I mentioned. We have a bilateral agreement that was established in, in 2020, and you can see on the screen there um, the, the announcements from the Minister in Australia uh, and in New Zealand um, when we began delivering this capability uh, in about mid-September. So uh, by the end of September, we had uh, early services, which are active today. You can use them today. Um, and we're, we're partnered with uh, industry, Lockheed Martin Australia, providing that capability. Uh, at the moment, we're using existing infrastructure to provide a minimum level of service while additional assets are deployed and, and that level of service is improved. Um, and ultimately, we'll be able to provide safety of life services to aircraft and, and any other users that, that might wish to, to use them. Um, so. What, are they, what do these services look like today? So the, the service area is in the, on the top left there. Um, the L1 SBAS service is provided in the light blue region. Um, it's limited by uh, the, the errors introduced by the ionosphere. So as you get further away from um, the, the reference stations, the, the service degrades. So that's why it's limited to um, the, the land masses there. Uh, dual frequency multi-constellation has less of a um, issue as you move away from, from the reference stations. So the service area that we've committed to is the exclusive economic zones of Australia and New Zealand, which you can see in the in the dotted line around here. Uh, however, um, the services are still available outside those areas. It 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 is still valid out. Yeah, I'll, and I've got some um, availability charts that I'll put up next. Uh, our service commitment is for the L1S bus open service, better than three meters horizontally and better than four meters vertically. Uh, the dual frequency open service uh, at the moment better than one and a half meters horizontal and two and a half meters vertical. That will improve over time. Uh, and our PPP precise point positioning via SouthPan open service is uh, at the moment better than 37 centimeters and, and 52 vertical uh, with an 80 minute convergence. Again, those figures will improve as we continue the deployment. Um, our service commitment is outlined in the service definition document. You can find that on our website, ga.gov.au slash SouthPan. There's also a fact sheet uh, for anyone interested in the technical details. And since the services are, are there, what do they look like? So um, the L1S bus service is on the top left. Uh, you can see we're easily exceeding the, uh, the service commitment. Um, Dual frequency multi-constellation on the bottom right, you can see it's not limited by uh, where the ground stations are, or, or at least um, are less limited by where the ground stations are, and you can see we're easily meeting the, the service commitment there. Uh, the satellites have quite a large broadcast area, um, the, the ones in geostationary Earth orbit. So at the top of the, the, the chart, you can see the satellite that we're using um, transmits uh, to that entire area that's visible. Um, so it, it's it's important for Australia and New Zealand, and we're providing services in Australia and New Zealand, but you can use this outside the service area. You can get some benefit. Um, just a caveat on the performance uh, availability charts there. 
these were measured over a relatively short period of time because we've only just started service provision. Uh, so it, it's probably a, a slight overestimate of, of the real service performance, but um, uh, we think users can reasonably expect that we're meeting the service performance commitment outlined in, in the standard. So how are we providing these services? Um, given that these systems take a while to build, uh, what, what in existing infrastructure are we using today to provide it? Well, the, the constellations are there. We're using GPS and Galileo uh, signals. Um, we're using existing Geoscience Australia and, um, and New Zealand, uh, what are called continuously operating reference stations. So they can provide the ob observations of the GNSS satellites. Um, they're not engineered to the degree that is required to provide safety of life services. So over time, they will be replaced with um, these other ground stations, dedicated ground stations for South Penn. Um, they're providing the, the observations to um, basically a, a prototype hardware and software uh, system uh, in northern New South Wales at a Lockheed Martin facility, uh, which is then uplinked to uh, an Inmarsat satellite that happens to have um, the SPAS capability on board. Uh, that satellite runs out of fuel in around 2028, so uh, we'll work to replace that as well as adding another satellite. Um, but this, this combination allows us to, to provide services today. Um, and uh, people can use it. We, you know, we set up a receiver out the front of the building here when the signal was first switched on, and we got a position solution using SouthPan. So we're very excited to be able to provide capability um, uh, this early. However, we're, we're going to improve that. So we have several um, kind of capability improvement uh, stages. Um, we're, the, we're, we're in the initial operating capability phase at the moment. Um, but by the time all the assets are deployed, both satellites, uh, both new satellites are, are deployed, uh, we'll achieve something called full operating capability um, and, and just go into service provision from then. So um, the this IOC phase uh, is, is uh, these numbers here are the indicated availability of the services. So in early 2024, uh, we'll achieve IOC 99.5, so we'll be delivering our, to our service commitment 99.5% of the time. In late 2026, we'll achieve 99.9% um, availability. Uh, we'll introduce a new navigation signal um, in 2027, uh, and this will allow the accuracy and convergence time for the PPP service to improve. Uh, and then in early 2028, um, we will have completed the engineering process and the certification process to allow aircraft to use uh, SouthPan, um, as well as any other safety of life services that might exist. Um, the second satellite will be delayed, uh, will be delivered in late 2028, and that will complete the, the rollout of SouthPan. Um, so in closing, I'd just like to say that uh, we're delivering a sovereign satellite navigation capability uh, that will provide the economic and societal benefits uh, that I discussed today. Um, to a broad range of industry and, and consumer users. Um, we'll continue to improve these services over the coming years and, and look forward to working with the users um, to understand the impact of, of SouthPan. Um, please feel free to contact Geoscience Australia through the email address on, on screen, clientservices at ga.gov.au. Uh, and of course, there's some further information um, on the website as well. So thank you for taking the time to attend today, both in the room and online. Uh, and I believe we have some time for questions.